I'm in the 14th chapter in the Gospel of Luke. And um, let me just give you a little bit of background. Uh, Jesus now is drawing great crowds. And uh, they are there for uh, all the miracles. And as the miracles happen, more and more crowds are coming out. But where I'm starting to read, Luke 14, and I'm going to begin reading uh, in uh, verse 25. He is talking um, to to the group. The disciples are there. The crowd is there too. But by the end of this this passage, you kind of get a sense that the crowds are going to start to walk away a little bit. You know, the glitz isn't there in this passage. Nobody wants to hear this passage and nobody understands this passage. And yet Jesus speaks it. Let me read it to you. Now, large crowds were going along with him. And he turned and said to them, If anyone, I'm sorry, um, if anyone comes to me and does not have his own uh, and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Hmm. Then he says, whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me, he cannot be my disciple. For which one of you, when he wants to build a a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish. All who observe it begin to ridicule him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, when he sets out to meet another king in battle, will not first sit down and consider whether he is strong enough with 10,000 men to encounter the one coming against him with only 20,000 men? Or else, while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So then, none of you can be my disciple who does not give up all of his own possessions. Therefore, salt is good. But even salt has, but if even salt has become tasteless, with what will it be seasoned? It is useless either for the soil or for the manure pile. It is thrown out. He who has ears, let him hear. This morning I want to talk to you about discipleship. And I want to just set some foundations. We're going to stay in this this vein a little bit for a couple of weeks until I feel the Lord wants me to move on. But I want to challenge you this morning. Last week we talked uh, and I shared from the book of Romans, the 12th chapter. We talked a little bit about being transformed. and uh, but But the scriptures even go more. When you start to look into the Gospels, Jesus is challenging us to become disciples. Uh, the, the passage at the front of your bulletin is from Matthew, the Great Commission, and, uh, and he tells his disciples to make disciples, baptizing them, uh, teaching them, and instructing them. What I'm saying to you today has nothing, well, it has nothing to do with salvation. Salvation and discipleship are two very different things. What do we need to be saved? Tell me what it is. What do you need to be saved? I come to you, I'm lost and undone, and you say to me what? Have the Lord in your life. So there's not, it's not by works. The scripture is very clear. Galatians, it's not anything I did that earned salvation. I didn't uh, genuflect 500 times and that was the magic number. The lights go off and you're saved. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't uh, reading the Bible eight hours a day and all of a sudden like, ooh, the Holy Spirit falls. No, salvation came at an invitation from the Lord Jesus. And he said, come unto me, all ye who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. We believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. We are born again. We are made new. We are refreshed and we are made alive. 
That's why Romans 12 is so powerful. Paul is talking to, to Christians. He's saying, you know, you need to be made alive in the things of God that, that be transformed. You accepted Christ, but now there's a process of transformation. It's the old story, and you probably all have heard this story, so please forgive me, but it's a story about the, the pig and the, and the chicken who were going to a local church together, and the pastor wanted to have a, a bit of a fundraiser, and uh, he thought we'll have a, a, a breakfast. And so on the way out of the church, the chicken says to the pig, this is a great thing because we can all do our part. He said, we can do bacon and, a- bacon and eggs for breakfast. And the pig stopped and looked at him and said, you may be dedicated, but I've got to be committed, you know, because there's no turning back for the pig, you know. I I want to say to you that there is something very important that right now for us as, as Christ Community Church and also for us as individuals to come face to face with. And the question is, are you a disciple of the Lord? Now, in the Greek, uh, uh, the word uh, teacher is, is used. When you go back uh, uh, and you read it, you, you understand that, that the person making a disciple, there's a relationship there between teacher and the disciple. Back in those days, there were many people having disciples around them. John the Baptist had disciples. There were, there, the Greeks believed in a philosophy of thought and reason and whatever, and so you would have Greek philosophers with their disciples around them, and they would sit and they would listen to uh, the Greek philosopher, and, oh, they would follow the philosophical thoughts and, and say, oh, I'm of this. The Jews also had disciples. You find out that Paul, in the book of Acts, was a student or a disciple, because that's what disciple means. It's a learner, it's a student of Gamil, who was one of the, be- the finest uh, uh, Jewish scholars uh, that, that they knew of. And Paul studied under Gamil. But when, and again, it's that relationship between the teacher and the student. And, and when we talk about, uh, the teachers, even in, uh, the Jewish tradition, it was, they believed in the law of Moses, and their idea was that they were going to teach all of the things surrounding to make you be able to follow the law of Moses. It was based on the law completely. So the Jews had over 300 more precepts and another 200 of uh, of suggested lifestyle changes and all of that stuff. But then Jesus comes on, on the scene. He doesn't offer a philosophy. He doesn't dwell on the law of Moses. He doesn't, he doesn't tantalize people to follow him. He doesn't uh, preach a big sermon and say, okay, now come. No, he walks up to fishermen and tax gatherers. And this is what he says. Hey, come follow me. And these guys do. They sell their nets. The, The tax gatherer walks away from a lucrative profession. And they follow Jesus. Because this relationship is not based on teachings of philosophers or on the exposition of the, of the Old Testament law. This relationship is based upon the relationship between the student and the great teacher, Jesus. Come unto me, all ye who are weary and heavy laden. It's interesting because when we got saved, we thought that was it. But the Lord is offering us even more. The scriptures teach that uh, to those who will, uh, they, they, are, they can become even the sons of God. Now that doesn't negate our salvation. 
But there's so much more in this life that we have to understand. This passage in Luke, I want to go through it with you just a little bit. And and I want to share some stuff. I'm not going to keep you a whole long time today because we do want to meet for prayer and I, I, I want us to get to that. But I, I want to lay a foundation today so that we can go forward and understand. The interesting thing about the, the disciples of Jesus, they were never coerced. They were never, they were never pushed. They were never, um, um, uh, made to feel that they were less than. They chose to follow the Lord. They chose with no great things. You know, the, the, the Pharisees all wore beautiful garbs and robes and they were respected and everybody would, oh, hello, you know, how you doing, you know, that kind of thing. They were, they were really revered in the community. Not so with Jesus' disciples. They were just part of Jesus' group. They had a relationship that was, was more like brothers. But yet, He, don't misunderstand me, he was definitely their teachers, their teacher. So I want to look at this passage for just a bit. Uh, Jesus begins to talk to the crowd about this, and, and I can tell you that they didn't jump for joy when they heard this. Most of them, and most of us don't understand even uh, this passage very well. And it's a challenge for us. And I want to say to you, listen, if you're not being challenged in your faith, there's something wrong. If you're not running into people that make you crazy, there's something wrong. If you're not, I mean, if you tell me, oh yes, I'm a disciple of the Lord, I, when I get up in the morning, I say, thank you God for the day, and I, I walk, I walk like a Christian. And I, how long do you pray? Well, I just, I don't have time afterwards, but, I do say, thank you, Jesus, for waking me up. I, I'm going to challenge you on that. I'm going to challenge you on that. We need to be challenged, especially in this world. This world is full of different philosophies, full of different people. Sometimes I have to just shut off Facebook because I am telling you, it's the meeting of nuts on Facebook. I don't know. It's just, you know what I'm saying? People with all kinds of crazy ideas and and. We need a break from all of that. We need to hear the voice of the one who called us. The first thing I want to say to you, your relationship to Jesus, if you want to be a disciple, the relationship to Jesus is paramount. That first, that first uh, 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 couple of verses where he says, if, any would co- if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, and wife and children, and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. I don't know how it was when you got saved. But I know that my mother said to me more than once, why do you hate me so much? (laughs) How could you do this to the family? What am I supposed to tell my friends? Now, I understand her difficulty. I was a nun. That was, although she didn't like me in the convent, I have to say, but at least it was something reputable. But when I said I wasn't going to be a nun anymore, oh, well, things happened. But then when I said I'm, going to be, I'm leaving the church, she was like, why are you doing this to me? I wanted to say that what Jesus is saying in this is that no one can come before God. No one can come before your service to the Lord. Not mother, not father, not wife, not husband, even not children. Your relationship to God must be yours. You can't blame it on how you were raised. You can't blame it on your pastor. Sorry. You can't blame it on the weather. Your relationship to Jesus is yours. And so my first question, how's that going? Is he truly first? And I have to say, you know, although everybody says, oh, yes, praise the Lord, he's first in my life. No, he's not. If we're truthful, we are all at different phases in all of this. I can tell you he's much more first in my life right now 
than he was last week or the week before or the week before that. Because for me, it's a process. I hate process. Just make it happen. Don't make me go through the process. You know, just get me to the 50-yard line. Just let me run. Get this guy off my back and let me just get there. I hate process. I hate it when the Lord starts messing with my clay. Can I tell you that? That's true. You know, I'm doing well, you know. I'm paying my bills. I got a car that runs and, you know, everything is good, you know. I'm happy. Everything is good. And then, boom. Is the Lord really the Lord in our life? And you know what? As I walk this life, every day there's challenges as to whether or not I really do believe that the Lord is first. I I need to be honest with you because I want you to be honest with you. I want that freedom. I told you this a while ago, about a year or so ago. I remember the I remember I was preaching. And I said, I need to be honest with you because I want to grow in the things of God. And there are times when I find myself in a quandary. Can you believe that? A quandary. Hmm. Do I people please? Or do I follow after God and his principles? Even if the people think I'm nuts or even if people don't think I'm, I'm, I'm normal. <laughs> I guess that's been settled. But <laughs> they're not ever anyway, so just face that. Where is God in your life? You cannot, you cannot just give lip service to this thing. It is the first question of the morning. Who is God in your life? If you're just having God on Sunday morning, i got to tell you, you're not a disciple. You're an attender of the church. And thank you for your check, and thank you for coming, and thank you for baking once a, week, once a month or something. But if God isn't your, your very first and most important love, you're just an attender. You're not a disciple. And that was the point Jesus was making. We must put him in the first place before anybody else. Before you share that love with your mother or father or share the love with, the, with your husband and, or, or wife or share the love even with your children, he must be first. If he's not, you're not sharing his love. You're sharing some stupid agape, mushy agape kind of thing that looks like love but isn't love because he's the author of love. So what he says is you got to hate all of the world except for me. That he would come first. That's a hard saying, Pastor. You're right, it is. You know, I, I get a little frustrated sometimes, Lord. Help me, help me with this. But I get a little frustrated because people watch TV and they see some pastor of some mega church talking about not worrying about sin and not considering it. Just be yourself. And the Lord loves you so much. And yes, he, he is with you. He understands if you fall into sin. He knows nobody's perfect. Just love him and he loves you and all of that. And I want to go, have you read the Bible? Have you, do you know the Bible at all, buddy? We are called to go higher, deeper, longer than the world, than anybody. The Lord has has something geared for me to get me to perfection. That's the goal. Listen, I'm nowhere near that. I go, oh, you must be very, a very patient Lord. But he has that for all of us. That we would seek him first. And yes, we fail. Yep. But I'm not going to stay in that failure. And I'm not going to call failure faith. I'm going to call it what it is. It's sin. And I want us to be honest enough with us to say, when I fail, it's sin because I failed. Not because, oh, uh, somebody got me upset and it really isn't my fault. No, we are disciples of God. If we fall short, it's because we have chosen to fall short. Every time. Oh, I hate saying that even. You know, I say, oh Lord, that was a harsh word. But you know what? It's the truth. If we fall short, if we are not, 
And I don't care what circumstance we're in. Uh, you know, Lindsay uh, uh, said today, you know, that she, she lost her job. And she was very, <laughs> I got fired from my job. That's what you said, Lindsay. You weren't even trying to sugarcoat it. I'm in transition. You know, you didn't try to. <laughs> you just said, I got fired from my job in, in December. <laughs> I love that, Lindsay. If we are in a situation where where we find ourselves in, in difficulty. If we've got a 160-pound guy on our back and we're trying to make it and all of a sudden, you know, we kind of we kind of get, cr- we're crushed under it. I want to tell you, the Lord has that for us because he wants us to see the victory in him. Lindsay's going through some stuff right now. She's got to pay bills. She's, you know, she's got to, uh, the, I'm sure not getting a paycheck is, is difficult. But God is going to see her through. You know why? Because God is first. When God is first, we get through everything. And some of us have been through a long tunnel, a dark tunnel, tunnel, uh, a painful tunnel. And yet, the Lord says, follow me. Put me first. But it hurts. I can't do it. This guy is too heavy on my back. Put me first. Just take that step. Come on, five more steps. Five more steps. You got, just listen to me. Five more steps. Just keep going on. That's when we're successful. Even if we're in the middle of the darkest period of our life, we just take the next step and know that God is leading us. That's when our faith expands and we become really what a disciple is all about. I, I, listen, I get to the point now where I, sometimes I just go, you've got to be kidding me. And I'm not talking about other churches, but in this church, I'm going to preach the truth. And I'm going to preach the fact that sometimes we fail. And when we fail, we acknowledge it. We ask God for forgiveness. He tells us to get back up and get back in the race and not to sit around and have a pity party. We are not some weakling, little, uh, slithering little animal somewhere. We are children of God. And yes, we make mistakes. And yes, we sin once in a while. But we have a God who loves us and strengthens us. And when our desire is to be a disciple, when our desire is to put him first, he's right there. Get up. Stop feeling... So- I've, <laughs> he has said that to me. I wanted to stay in bed. I was going through, you know, some stuff in seminary that was rough. <laughs> I'm telling you, it was terrible. I woke up one morning, and I'm going, God, I can't do this. I know I'm never going to be able to preach again. I know this is a... And the voice of the Lord said to me, get up. What? <laughs> what? Get up. Oh, <laughs> is that what I do? <laughs> and I began to see the hand of the Lord. I got up washed my face, walked out, prayed for an hour and a half, went back, and and the Lord was with me all the way. But it's those times when we are tested to see where is he in our lives. Shame on us if when we're challenged with a test that we choose the easy way. So many Christians have this philosophy of, it's all nice, it's all good, it's all happy, everything is wonderful. And I want to tell you, tell me again about it when he says, he who doesn't hate his mother, his father, his sister, brother, wife, husband, children. Uh, tell me how that is easy. But if you're called to be a disciple, we turn our back on the world. That's what we do. Then he says this over here, I want to move on here. He says, 27, whoever does not carry his own cross, in other words, you can't carry my cross. Even if I try to blame you for it, it's not yours, it's mine. He who doesn't carry his own cross and come after me um, cannot be my disciple. But Lord, it's heavy. I can't carry this cross anymore. I'm not able. I'm not able. Yes, you are. You must, the cross that we have, each of us, you know, we could sit around and talk for, we could do a whole day on this, on this uh, one sermon. All of us have certain things in our lives that we're carrying, difficulties that nobody knows, challenges in our life and on our walk with the Lord that, that we haven't shared with anybody, and that's okay, as long as we're sharing them with the Lord. I want you to know that we have to carry our cross, and how we carry our cross determines our devotion to the Lord. 
Some people carry the cross and stop at every person and say, see what I got? See what I got to carry? See what I got to carry? I'm just, God's given me this cross. Praise the Lord. Just give me the cross. And then you find people going through much worse. Terrible trials. Terrible difficulties. Terrible times where people are sick in their lives and what have you. And they go through it. Not jumping up and down. They're not crazy. They're just carrying their cross. But they're carrying the cross. The cross that they have with God's love and peace and their eyes are focused on the Lord. Does it hurt? You bet it hurts. Is it difficult? You bet it's difficult. It wouldn't be called a cross. Listen, back in the time of Jesus, he uses this. He's getting very close to his own time with his own cross. But he uses this and in an era where crucifixion, everybody knew it was the, it was the most horrendous thing. We've kind of whitewashed it, you know. But uh, if you ever read Lee Strobel's book on uh, the case for Easter, he goes through all of the Good Friday uh, terrible things that go on in the body as they're being crucified. It was a terrible, and there was one thing. If you saw some guy walking around with a cross on his back, it meant death. He was a walking dead man. That guy was going to be dead in a matter of hours. The most painful death that you could imagine. And yet, we wear the cross around our neck. We, we have cross earrings and cross necklaces and cross bracelets and all of this. Isn't it interesting that for us who are disciples, the cross is something beautiful. Why? Because we know that our Savior, our Master, died upon that image of death so that we would have life. Now you don't see anybody walking around with an electric chair around their neck. (laughs) Oh, nice electric chair. Where did you get it? (laughs) No. But for us as Christians, if we're wearing crosses like jewelry, it means nothing. But for a Christian to wear a cross, I have one on my jacket, I don't have one on my shirt. But for a Christian to wear a cross, what does that mean? That means that the image of death, this death, reminds me of the great love of God for me. And that I am called to carry my cross. I am called to lay myself down. I am called to die. Uh, This message, Pastor. Die. (laughs) I want to tell you something. A disciple's ready to die. A disciple's ready to die. We read stories, when you read um, um, the martyr book, uh, uh, the martyr book, with all the martyrs in it. Jesus Freaks also has one. But um, Book of Martyrs. Um, You read stories of, of people who laid their life down for the cause of Christ. Uh, we read uh, of of ministers and priests who were in concentration camps and 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 said to the uh, the the Nazis, "Take my life instead of his. He has a family." And they laid their life down. We are not called to do that right now for one another. I don't know what the future holds. We may at some time be called to do that. But what we are called to the call is just as powerful. We're called to lay our life down for the cause of Christ. There's no, there's no, no way to, to sugarcoat it. We can't make it uh, uh, a happy thing. Oh, yay! Except for the fact that we know that God has called us to it and that we're getting closer to the Lord. But make no mistake, we live a life that is given. It's not our life anymore. We don't make rational decisions about things. We make spiritual decisions that govern our lives. I'm not saying that we're all crazy. I'm not saying that, you know, well, God told me, God told me, God told me. No, if God told you, how does it follow, if you're a disciple, how does it follow this? We lay our lives down. We become a servant unto God. And when the Lord speaks to us, encourages us, us to do something, whether it's putting money in someone's hands or in the bucket or uh, perhaps giving away something or whatever. When the Lord tells us to do something, we answer to God, not to what other people are going to say about it. 
We are called to carry our cross, our own cross. Sometimes it means teenagers, just saying. <laughs> it, it, you know, it, that's truly what it means. Sometimes we're, <coughs> excuse me, we're able to go out into the community and be great servants. And then at our own home and our, with our families, we, we can't quite get it. We become defensive, become angry, we become, um, enough said. That's exactly right. By laying our lives down. That's right. And to become a disciple means you are an overcomer. It's good. Okay. I want to go on. Um, it says, um, in verse 28, it says, uh, For which one of you, when he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? And then he goes on to talk about, because you're going to get started and you're not going to complete it. He, what Jesus is saying, count the cost, understand what this means, and then come follow me. He wants them to recognize what the cost is. The cost is our lives. The cost is, you know, I am not first uh, uh, a police officer. I'm not first a teacher. I am not first anything. I am first a disciple. I belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. And he breathes his life into me so that I can lay my life down for others. And for him first. And then for others. Count the cost. Understand. Some people just aren't ready for it. And I understand that. And let's be honest about it. If you're not, that's all right. That's between you and the Lord. You're saved. I'm not saying you're not saved. You're not. You're saved. You're going to heaven. Hallelujah. But there's so much more. We will never know the joy of serving until we die. We'll never know the joy of serving. We'll never know the joy of being a disciple. We'll never, we'll never get spiritual mysteries because we've got so much of our own uh, natural junk in us. We're so influenced by the world. We will never understand the deep mysteries of faith because we're so cluttered with the natural. Do you understand what I'm saying? But when we, I didn't even wait for a response, but when we completely give ourselves to the Lord, and we're walking in it and, it, and it doesn't happen overnight. It happens every day. This commitment to di- being a disciple of God, when we when we commit ourselves to that and we begin to walk in it, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, revelation comes to us. Things that we hadn't thought about before, but it's there. I want to tell you, count the cost. It says, uh, it says, you know, otherwise he s- starts to build and building, and then he can't finish it. Or if you're a king, you're going into battle, and you don't uh, you don't count the cost. You don't have the manpower to win the battle. We need to count the cost because this isn't something we play with. This isn't something that is um, just a philosophy. It's a way of life, you know. There, uh, you, you can drive any place uh, around in Hartford or even, maybe even around here. I don't know the region very well, but, but you can see buildings that get started to be built and then they don't build, finish them. Sometimes houses, sometimes uh, uh, industrial parks, they begin to build it and then the company goes belly up before they can even finish the building. And you know, you look at it and you go, the foundation was laid, but what happened? Don't let that be you. Don't let that be me, Lord. In this this call to discipleship, I want to finish well. I want, and the way we finish our life well is by finishing every day well. And the, how we finish every day well is that we finish every hour well. See, it's ju- it's a practice. It's a process. Finally, I want to just say this. Are we okay, everybody? Okay. All right. Every day. Every day. He talks about salt at the end of this. Um, uh, Verse 34. Therefore, salt is good, but even salt has become tasteless. With what will it be seasoned? It is useless either for the soil or for the manure pile. It is thrown out. He who has ears, let him hear. He said, he says, 
the thing that's the preservative in your life, the truth that preserves you, is attuned to salt that in those days was, were, was used to preserve meats and other other things. It would encrust it in salt and it would act as a sealant for uh, meat so it wouldn't get bad. And he's saying, when that salt ha- has pure salt, by the way, will will always be will always be strong pure salt but back in those days they would get i had read some place in, uh, in uh, uh, on the internet that in those days they would go and uh, get water from the dead sea and dry it out and they that's how they would get some of their salt they did, didn't always mine it mining salt was was very important, but they didn't always mine it back then. And that salt was junk, the salt from the Dead Sea, because it was mixed with all kinds of minerals. And it really didn't do its job at all. And the meat would still uh, be bad. And what they would say is this, the Lord said, is throw it out. You don't want to live a life that's thrown out. You don't want to, at the end of your life, look back and say, was any of it real? We need to make a decision today. And we're going to stay in this because I want to, I want to go through some of the elements of discipleship with all of you. Because uh, when you turn to the front of your, your bulletin in Matthew 28, uh, he's calling us to make disciples. Not just, not just get people saved, but rather make them disciples. When you pray for somebody... When you're praying for somebody, you know, sometimes we pray for somebody for a long time and then finally you get an opportunity to share the gospel with them and you pray with them. Guess what? You are called not just to leave them now, but to make disciples with them, to let them understand the glory that it is in serving God, that he is our master and our Lord and he is our rabbi and our teacher and he uh, is the one that we answer to alone. Nothing will hold us back from serving God. Amen? Amen. Let's all stand. (coughs) All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the end of this age. Heavenly Father, we just come to you, Lord, right now. And Father, there's so much in our own personal lives, Lord, when we think about it. Lord, we become overwhelmed. So, Father, I pray, Lord, today that our our heart is to become disciples, Lord that we would lay our life down. We would not choose our own way. We would not uh, uh, try to please man. But Lord, we are here. Lord, we want to please you. We are your disciples. So Lord, I would pray, Almighty God, that you would begin to stir our heart. And as we are challenged to lay things down, Lord, that we would do so immediately and with great love and joy. For Lord, everything we have is yours. Lord, we pray, Lord, that you would begin the sanctification in our lives. Lord, setting us apart for the master's use. Lord, that we would be able to serve purely, serve without uh, thinking about what we're going to get out of it. Lord, I, I, I pray, Lord, that you would, would work that in my life, that I would be true only to you, Lord. Father, we just love you this day. Seal this word in our hearts, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.